Aloha, everyone. Welcome to this new episode of TNG. And we have a very special guest, one of my favorite uh, Instagram page owners or page runners, <laughs> page creators. Daniel Hart from Sustainability Champions. Welcome, Daniel. And just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do for the world. Well, thank you very much, Owen. And thank you for having me on the show and for the opportunity to tell uh, the story of Sustainability Champions. So uh, Sustainability Champions started a, about two and a half years ago, back in the beginning of uh, 2019. And essentially the, the way it came about was uh, I, I'm very interested in, in the environment. I'm very passionate about living in a clean and beautiful earth and planet. And every time I would see anything about the environment, like in the news uh, or any other really media channel, everything looked really negative. Uh, you know, there's a lot of doom and gloom about the environment and just how bad everything is, whether it's plastic pollution or climate change, et cetera. And so my interest was really in understanding, well, if this is how bad everything is, there's got to be someone who's doing something about this. And when I started looking around, actually, it's true. There's all sorts of amazing people all over the planet who are working really hard to solve these incredibly massive and very complicated challenges. And the more I started to look, the more I realized, actually, it's almost like there's an infinite number. And that's essentially how Sustainability Champions came about. It's an antidote to the negativity of basically the uh, what, what we're seeing about the environment. And I, I don't really like to say that what the media is doing is bad or wrong because ultimately the media is providing very helpful information. News is really important. You know about what's going on in the world. Um, but I think that sometimes it can focus a little bit too much on the negative side. And so I want to sort of counteract that or rather balance it out by saying, here are all of the people who see the same challenges that everyone else is seeing and they're choosing to do something about it. And um, I find it very motivational and inspirational and it seems that others find it too. And I'm very, very grateful for that. Yeah. And that's exactly why I follow your page. It's just, Every time I look at sustainability champions is like a little spark of hope. You know, sometimes it's like little things that people are doing and sometimes it's like a massive genius invention that somebody made to clean the ocean or uh, something to do with uh, transforming the soil in a beneficial way. But every time I see it is like, I call it your page, the good news network. It's like, I've always wanted that. I've always wanted to like put on a news outlet or a media outlet and actually be informed about what we can do. Mm. And that's exactly what you do. And um, I can tell already that you're very intelligent and come about things uh, in a very intellectual way. Uh, and on the same note for people like myself who come about it in a more spiritual way is, uh, environmental consciousness is coming from our ability to think and problem solve. So I'd love to ask you, what is your take on how we can all kind of enhance our environmental consciousness in our ability to create change at small levels or even profound levels? So I, I really like what you said about the fact that the Sustainability Champions features individuals who are working on a wide variety of levels from very small. I mean, there's, um, you know, people who organize beach cleanups in areas where it's never been done. Um, I, I mean, that can be considered big in its own way. Um, or for instance, some, just one person picking up a lot of cigarette butts and turning it into something or just getting rid of them to uh, really innovations that completely change how things can be done. And the reason I'm saying this is because ultimately, if you have an idea and, and you know, Owen, you just said it yourself that you've wanted to create some sort of media channel or a network of some sort where 
you talk about what can be done about the good things that are happening. Um, ultimately, to answer your question about what can be done, I would say start with number one, where you are now. And um, because where you are now is, well, that's where you are. So it's the best place to start. In fact, it's the only place to start. And then if you have an idea, just go for it. And don't be afraid of, of failing. Don't be afraid of being uh, you know, made fun of or, or being criticized in any way. Because first of all, you probably will be at some point in time, but that's okay. Um, and second of all, if you have that idea, if it's sitting inside you and if, if it wants, if that idea wants to get out, uh, one way to look at it is that's your destiny. That's what you're meant to do. And sometimes it's an, an amazing. Uh, the journey is not at all straightforward. Um, you know, I'm, I'm only two and a half years into this. So I'm, I'm not one to really speak about a long journey, but what I, what I can say is you start on one path, you start moving in one direction and, as you begin moving, your momentum builds, number one. And then number two is you start to learn about what actually you like, what you don't like, what's important to you, what's not important to you. And these are things that you would have never really understood or realized until you be begin. Um, and then you start to you know, change tack. It's like sailing. I, I don't sail, but I've heard a lot of sailing analogies. So I'll just continue on with it. Um, yeah, you just start to kind of shift direction. You know, you, you position your sails according to a new wind. Uh, you discover new things about yourself, about what the world needs, wants, et cetera. And, and you hear so many interesting ideas as you go. And so my, really, that's a, that's a very long answer too. Uh, and I'll boil it down to basically begin where you are and whatever idea you have is valid. And, and I think if you take a look at sustainability champions, you'll start to see the ideas that people have. Some of them are, um, they're so innovative. Others are kind of these, I, I suppose they're very creative, you know, and if, and if these individuals stopped because they thought, well, people are going to think this is weird or people are going to laugh at me, or I don't know if this is the right thing to do, the invention would have never come about. And that's what inspires people is that they go for it. They just do it and they refine and they keep going and they keep refining. And eventually you actually have something that's amazing. And then it becomes normal. Absolutely. The part you hit on the hit the nail on the head with is the part about pushing through criticism, mm. right? So we all experience at some level criticism, whether it's like emotional, whether it's not spoken or whether it's spoken right in your face, we face criticism. And some of the ideas that are on sustainability champions, some of the inventions are really quirky, um, but we live in a world that's not really uh, fully natural anymore. So a lot of the things that culturally, uh, societally are natural are very unnatural. And one of the things that I, uh, one of the really good inventions I saw on uh, your page is, it was like a urinal, like a bathroom, that had some sort of plant that it feeds. And so people walking around might criticize or judge that, oh, you're like peeing in a plant pot. But that's what better way, what better answer than nature itself? What it's better so answer true. than nature herself to clean up our mess? I mean, I made this meme a while back and a lot of people really loved it and it was uh, I was kind of joking and making fun of, I was personally criticizing the way we handle our sewage systems uh, for the most part, globally dumping them into the ocean. Uh, and, <laughs> and I said, trees literally eats our pee and poop for breakfast. Humans, let's dump all our pee and poop into the ocean. It was like, some ideas that that are beneficial for the earth are really simple and it's like not our credit it's nature herself is healing and cleaning up like a good mother does cleans up and teaches us and helps us and some are really far out there i mean like some of the ideas of like turning 
carbon in the atmosphere into diamonds is really magnificent. And mm. it's like, I couldn't make that up. I mean, I could write it in a book, but I couldn't physically create some sort of wizardly machine that could do that, you know? I think on, on that point, um, in terms of what you can and can't create, I think that's what's beautiful about sustainability champions and really just about, I suppose, nature is everyone has a role to play and everyone has their skills, talents, interests, abilities, motivation, desire, et cetera. And so what I'm learning is it's really important to understand what you enjoy and what you what you're passionate about because if you go for that you'll excel in it and if you excel in that you know you don't have to feel bad that you're not focusing on other issues because there will be other people there's like we're approaching 8 billion humans on the planet so there will be someone else somewhere out there who will excel just like you excel in one area who will excel in something else and so you have physicists who understand how to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and turn it into a diamond. I have no clue how to do that either. I'm, I'm not inclined in that direction. But what I enjoy doing is listening to people's stories and talking to people and perhaps a physicist who can engineer that kind of, as you call it, a wizardly machine, maybe that's not their strength. And so they focus on that. And together, you know, where we become kind of like a quilt, we're, we're a patchwork of all of these ideas. And, and I think that's what makes things so interesting is there are so many different points of view. Uh, and so it's perfectly not just okay, but it's, it's natural, it's normal to be, to not understand how certain things work and, and really to let others who do focus on that while you kind of, it, I mean, I think this is where meditation is really important. Writing a lot is important to really understand who you are as an individual and to understand what your, uh, yeah, you know, what's important to you. And um, yeah, the way I perceive that is what is kind of your lens of fulfillment or joy, right? So we have uh, people who look at the world very scientifically and that brings them joy and that's their lens or you have people that look at life uh, very mystically and that brings them joy or you have people that look at things very philosophically and that brings them joy and there's all sorts of different mixtures and and combinations of these different types of consciousness these different lenses uh, but you made a really good point in that you're not really going to uh, be able to get to a certain level of impact until you operate from where you're at. And some people are operating from where other people are at. And I'll explain that a bit is say somebody is from the age of three, four, they started talking and they love unicorns, they want to be a wizard, they love Harry Potter, they're very like mystical minded. And then all throughout their life, they're told, oh, no, 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 no. That's not the way to look at the world. That's not the way to look at the world. And then they fall into a more scientific mind. And then they're not happy. And it can say, happen the same exact way around somebody who's very scientific, rational minded early on and then they have people that are oh look at life with more love light rainbow sunshine uh, but when you relate to the environment in a way that brings you personally joy then you have infinite fuel and that's something that i've experienced with like that snowball effect that once i stopped trying to fit other people's puzzling <laughs> ways of looking at reality and found my inner peace. I was like, oh, I look at nature in a completely different way to somebody who's very scientifically minded. I'm very much more mystical, more Taoist, more Hindu, more meditative yoga, Qigong. And that's how I personally connect with the earth and 
with the energies around, but that's not the answer, you know? Love is the answer, and love can be for anything. Good, bad, happy, or sad, scientific, spiritual, spiritual, scientific. If you love something, you're going to have infinite energy to fulfill that goal. And then you have uh, to relate it back to sustainability champions. Some of these geniuses are in a country with very limited resources, are in a country with very little even like uh, access to really good food or really good water. And you can see their love for the environment, whatever lens they're looking at the environment through propels them to create this uh, healing invention for the planet or for the community. Yeah, it's very true. I, and I think that's precisely the point of um, start where you are right now. Um, you know, the, the, the book Be Here Now. And um, that's precisely the point. Um, it's about recognizing exactly where you are and, and really the only moment we have is right now. And so if you fight any of that and you want to be somewhere else, some when else and someone else, um, life becomes very difficult because you're essentially not actually, you're technically not in reality anymore. You're, um, you're, you're thinking of some of a whole nother time, place, space, person. Um, there's actually a lot of power in, in sort of letting go of all of that and becoming exceptionally present. And um, what is it? Wayne, Dr. Wayne W. Dyer always says, let go and let God. And I think that's precisely the point is just let go. And in that amazing moment of letting go, sometimes that's when inspiration strikes like a lightning bolt. You know, it's very powerful. Or sometimes it's, it's not very profound at all. And it's just sort of like, huh, that's a good idea. Let's see what happens there. And I think it's really, really important to, um, to understand, uh, to get into those places of sort of quiet, mental quietness and, um, and just be for a bit because a lot of those answers about what I love and you know what's important, um, they typically just very, very naturally come out in that moment. And it's easy to, um, it's easy to take action from that point if action is ne necessary or, or required. Love that you brought up Ram Das is I actually had the chance to meet Ram Das in, uh, when I was living in uh, Hawaii on Maui. And wow, uh, cool. Yeah, I get a bit emotional because he passed away not too long ago. But uh, yeah, my Qigong and Chinese medicine and uh, Shiatsu teacher at uh, school uh, was a devotee of Ramdas. And to bring that presence and that Be Here Now, the Ramdas author of Be Here Now, that sacred mantra is. Um, to bring it into perspective with environmental consciousness is his house is one of the most ecologically sustainable places I've been in my entire life. And it's not like he's actively looking and searching and studying to achieve this is really like he relates to it in a meditative way and the people around him help him out and have helped him out in the past because now he's passed on but uh yeah it's fruit trees growing naturally solar panels uh beautiful flowers and gardens and trees at his home which is now i think is open to the public it's uh, now called hanuman house i think or something like that but uh yeah it's just it kind of showed me because maui was really a profoundly uh, ecological educational school for me when I lived there uh, because the earth itself the soil is so volcanic and and fertile uh, but also because of the people there that whether they were a local Hawaiian who was connecting with the land through prayer and through very mystical uh, traditional 
ways or somebody like my friend uh, Bruce Douglas, who is my favorite <laughs> favorite landlord of all time. He's just like this old hippie Gandalf, uh, uh, long blonde surfer hair. And he's uh, he had a really good story. I'm bouncing around now, but the property that uh, I lived on with him and with uh, several other friends was this beautiful property with he um, builds ecologically created um, bamboo and coconut hardwood tiny homes. Uh, he gets them over from like puzzle pieces from Bali and uh, brings them over to Maui and California and all these other places. And I lived in one that's really, really beautiful, fun experience. And he had a really good story of uh, helped me have more compassion for the dark side of the environmental battle going on right now. So as you may already know, in, in Hawaii, uh, Monsanto, uh, which is like the dark lord <laughs> of, of environmental destruction is uh, with genetically modified organisms and uh, heavy chemical uh, pesticides and stuff like that. Uh, there's a big battle in Hawaii going on between uh, local people, Hawaiian people, and also kind of hippies that have come over and uh, scientists that have come over and are battling this environmental crisis. Uh, but Bruce told me, he said that he met the uh, one of the lead guys at Monsanto, one of the higher ups that's making loads of money. And he told me, he said, I thought, oh, and I thought that I was going to be screaming and cursing at him. And I thought I wouldn't be able to hold back about my hatred for him. But when I met him, Bruce said this, he said, I said, thank you for being the perfect adversary for showing the world what not to do. And I'm a better person because of the horrible things that you're doing. I'm countering it. And that was really helpful for me because it kind of took me out of the anger and more into the solution based thinking rather than trying to sort of just like fist blazing help the environment really come back to like everyone's just trying to do the best with what they have. And for some people, money is more important, uh, the more important green than the grass. But um, they're on their own path and all we can do is do our best, you know? I think, I think money is, uh, it's a very, it's a really interesting topic. And um, I think if we can take a look at, um, if we can kind of change the way we view money um, and not see it as a, um, if you have money, then you can't be ecologically minded or environmentally friendly. And if you're environmentally friendly, then you can't have anything to do with money. I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sure there's economists who are uh, substantially more intelligent than me who can, who can talk about this in much greater depth and detail. But my take is that you can absolutely have both. Um, and they, if you make one the enemy, then well, you'll be right. Um, and it'll become extremely difficult to live in a, in, a, in a world and in a society where money is the way things work, um, at least for now. And so one thing that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing more and more, and, and I find a lot of, um, I think this is, a, this is a, I suppose, a good thing, is that um, basically we are moving towards a, an economy where uh, being environmentally friendly and being sustainable is being demanded by consumers. And my take, and, and maybe this will change as, as I learn more and as you know, I, I grow and all of this, um, but my current sort of philosophy is that if capitalism got us into this mess, then capitalism or something similar to it can get us out of it. Um, 
And what we're seeing is that this growing demand from consumers, especially in, you know, well, we're in countries where I live, like the US and, and the UK, the growing demand is absolutely pushing companies to at least think about it. And I mean, we see some bad negative sides to it as well in, in that there's greenwashing and, you know, companies are, are looking to um, just take advantage of this, quote, trend by, um, by just, you know, slapping a, a, some exciting label on, onto an otherwise unsustainable product. Um, to me, I, I actually see that as a good sign. It means that companies are, they're, they're trying. Um, obviously, there's, there's plenty of... Um, plenty of room to grow. Um, but the fact that they even feel that that's necessary goes to show that uh, this is what is becoming normal. And um, if the large corporations are, are doing that and they feel like they need to play catch up, what we're actually seeing with smaller companies who find the products and, and services currently available unacceptable, smaller companies are going in and actually doing some pretty unbelievable things as far as, you know, changing the way packaging is made, changing the way food is grown, changing the way paper is made. I mean, uh, speaking of paper, there is this incredible notebook I found, I've, I've, we've featured on Sustainability Champions that's made of rock, um, basically old construction rock cement stuff that would otherwise be thrown away. And they gather all of it and turn it into practically indestructible paper, it's a notebook and you can just buy it on online. So, I mean, that's incredible. That's so cool. And, you know, these, the reason why they're, why these companies are coming about is because there is this demand for it. And I'm completely and totally fine. And I 100% support companies choosing to make these kind of changes and choosing to do all of this and earn money, make a profit and basically thrive off of helping people, helping the planet, because it's a very easy way to quantify your impact. And it's a very easy way to ensure that, you know, services can be made, people can, can get stuff and money, money is a really useful tool in that sense. And so, um, and, you know, if, if we're, you know, let's, let's say I start a company where I'm doing something sustainable and you pay me and I'm making a profit, what I'm going to, what I personally would want to do with a portion of that profit, in addition to paying rent and buying food, et cetera, is donate it and see more good come out of the money. Um, and, and to me, I, I find money to be a very useful tool in that way. Um, and of course, I mean, money has a dark side as well, as you just described, you know, it makes people kind of cut corners potentially, or, or go straight for the profit without thinking about anything else. But that's where capitalism is such a beautiful thing is because we're now becoming more and more educated about the environmental challenges and our demands are changing and, and we're accepting less and less of sort of, here's a product that's bad for the environment. That's okay. I'll get it. Um, it's not becoming as it's, it's becoming less and less okay, I suppose, and less and less uh, demanded by the consumers. So um, I think that's a very, I, I think from that point of view, it's um, we're moving into this direction of sustainability. Yeah, and what you said also has little uh, gems of wisdom for uh, people's emotional health also during these present uh, times, both politically, economically, people, some, a lot of people are feeling powerless. A lot of people are feeling uh, more powerful than they've ever felt as well. Um, but for those watching, if there's like a feeling of kind of despair or powerlessness, what Daniel just said uh, has this gem of wisdom that I kind of first got from John Lennon. And he said, power to the people, the power is in the people. If everybody demanded peace instead of a new television set or a new car, we'd have it tomorrow. And what you said about the environmental demand is showing exactly that. Companies that were not even anywhere near even thinking about 
ecological sustainability and ecological cleanliness and productivity are now saying, oh, well, we're not going to make any money <laughs> anymore if we, if we don't uh, submit to these demands by the people, by the masses. And when you look at the power of each individual person, every purchase matters. Every purchase matters is either a vote for uh, ecological prosperity, ecological proliferation, or it's a vote for its demise. And one of the things that is also really key is what we do with our money. You know, so exactly as you said, there's there's no dichotomy. There's no money's evil. Uh, money's really the best thing in the world. It's not either of those things. Like there was this, uh, I don't know if he was Swiss or Swedish, he was some sort of European billionaire who purchased a massive plot of forest in the Amazon. And he just purchased it to keep it there. And it's things like that, that I can't do that. I don't have billions of dollars to, to buy a part of the Amazon rainforest. I would love to, I would love to have that. And um, I got this really great uh, wisdom quote came to me in meditation one time, and it was that a fool can turn even a mansion into a prison. And one who is masterful can turn any building into a temple. And that's kind of the, the gist or the uh, vibration of the vibe of what we all can do individually to make our communities better, to expand those communities outwards uh, virtually through the internet as well, is to make our own space, whether it's our body space, whether it's our home space, whether it's our uh, social networks that we're connected to, making that a either if you like the word sacred or just respected like deeply respect the space and the land that you're on and i had an opportunity to meet native american elders on a road trip and uh quite a few of my friends are both uh native american and uh the way in which they honor the land is holistic. You know, it's like the way they honor the land and not, not every Native American does this, but just the idea of giving deep respect to the land makes something like a redwood tree have flowers under it instead of uh, alcohol bottles or alcohol cans. And I really thought about that the other day because I was in a local park and I went under this beautiful cedar tree and there's broken glass and, and alcohol cans. And I'm like, I immediately thought to myself, this would not happen in a Native American tribe. This would not happen in an Indian uh holy place. This would not happen in uh, several places that have deep reverence for the land. Even European places like Norway, where they have deep love for the fairies. <laughs> now I'm going airy fairy a bit. <laughs> but like in sacred places like Isle of Skye in Scotland and the fairy uh, fountains and springs in Norway, they will respect and clean the nature spot because in folklore, they believe that there's fairies or energies there that take care of the environment and you need to respect that space. So <laughs> I, I've gone off on a tangent, but I would love to pass it back to you. And um, I would love to hear about some of your personal uh, favorite features that you've had on your, uh, on your page of sustainability champions. Yeah. Well, I think just going back to um, what you were saying, I think um, one thing that's important 
to remember, and sometimes this is very easy to forget, um, is that actually we are nature. We are not just we're, we're not just part of it, and we don't just visit nature. Actually, we are nature. And even if you're in the middle of a busy city, that's actually nature. It's designed by nature, i.e., people, and that's it. It is nature. Um, there's definitely something that's much more peaceful inside of a forest, but technically a city is nature. And it, it's, it's very strange to think about it that way because it, it seems like, well, actually a city is not nature. A city is this human built thing. But if we are nature and if we're part of that, and if, you know, as you were saying, Native American, uh, men, the Native American mentality is to honor the land and it's a very holistic approach. And, and that's probably because the, the realization is that actually they're just one, people are just one of the many, many infinite pieces of the puzzle of nature. Uh, and so <clears throat> I think this is probably one of the things that uh, may contribute to the challenges that we're facing is that we think we're not part of nature. We're somehow either above it or just it doesn't really affect us in that um, we're, we're just separate from it, but actually we're, we're just one of the millions or billions or trillions or infinite pieces of, of nature. Um, and so with that being said, uh, to answer your question, actually, I have a, a bit of a, an answer that, that doesn't directly answer your question. My, my favorite features are actually, I would say everyone, and the reason why I say this is because it, it comes back to, to what we've been talking about, which is uh, everyone on Sustainability Champions has a very similar trait. And that's they've seen a challenge. And typically the challenges they see are overwhelming to say the least. These are massive global challenges. And for some for many, I would imagine the problems are so big that they just say, you know what, I, some, I, I can't deal with it. Someone else will do it or, you know, I'm just not going to worry about it. Social media is way more interesting than this. And despite that, they've decided to find a solution and go for it. And every single person that we feature has this same trait to me. And, and that's really inspirational and motivational to me. And so I suppose it's almost like, uh, I'm more interested in honoring the source rather than where the fountain actually uh, or where the stream comes out because there's so many different solutions. There are so many different challenges that need to be solved that to pick one means that I'm discounting or sort of ignoring another and, and they're all equally important in their own ways. And that's why I love sustainability champions is because these, the individuals that we have that we feature and, and we're, we're just featuring a, a very small sample. There's so many more uh, people all over the world who are doing things that maybe no one's ever heard of. They're, they're unavailable to find because they're doing it under the radar and, you know, it, but it's this passion for solving extremely complicated challenges that are affecting that, that affect our, our future. And despite the odds, despite the fact that these problems may take decades or even centuries to fully solve, they go for it anyway. And so um, I think this is, that, that's really what I'm, what I'm hoping to, to get across through sustainability champions. It's, it's what, what I think about every time I see um, the people that we're featuring is, you know, here's someone who's doing something, what can I do? And, and as you were saying, it could be very, very small. It could be as small as you see a cup under a tree and it definitely shouldn't be there. So you just pick it up and throw it away or, um, you know, questioning every purchase that you make, not in the sense of like, you know, why am I doing this and having an existential crisis as you hold a banana, but more, um, it's more like, is this the, is this the most sustainable choice or perhaps I should choose something else? Um, and when you start just kind of looking at, at things through that lens, as you said, every purchase makes a big difference. Every purchase matters. Um, and just by changing a little bit your habits, 
every day, every week, or just looking at it and observing and, and seeing what works and what doesn't, you start actually making a huge difference. And, and one thing that I'm noticing more and more is that when one person makes a change, there is this ripple effect and it actually sort of activates other people nearby. And it doesn't even need to be people that you know or hang out with. It can sometimes be a random person at the store who sees, oh, they're bringing their reusable bag. Uh, I should probably bring mine as well. And you may not even be next to each other. They may have just seen it from across the way. And so just doing the right thing is, it's incredibly powerful in that sense as well. I call that the uh, New York crosswalk uh, <laughs> dynamic. One person crosses the street without the crosswalk sign on, and then everyone goes. Like one person sees a good uh, ecological effort and goes, "Oh, I could, I could plant a few trees. What about well, stick an acorn in the ground and pour some water on it? That's not that hard." Uh, your response to the that question was absolutely the most perfect response that could have ever uh, thought up. Anyone could have ever thought up, and. It makes one think, you know, that humans, and this is a very kind of shamanic uh, way of looking at it, kind of an uh, indigenous way of looking at it, is humans are all different aspects of nature, as he said. And a fly doesn't do the same thing that an elephant does. Doesn't make it any less important. Flies are constantly flying around, cleaning up shit. They clean up way more shit than we do. Squirrels are planting more trees than any person I know. Uh, and elephants, they, I saw this thing that elephants with their tusks, like create rivers, carve rivers and oh, bring wow. uh, entire lands back to life. Hmm. And humans do the same thing. There's this one um, man who made a whole, I must have seen this on your page, if, if not another ecological page, but it's probably sustainability champions. But this one man brought an entire rainforest back to life. Him and his, him and his partner, his wife, brought an entire rainforest back to life. There was this uh, Asian elder man, and he planted an entire magnificent flower garden for his wife who lost her sight so she could smell all these wonderful flower smells. So it's like every little effort or every big effort has a different kind of flavor to it or a different uh, harmony or sound to it. And I want to bring this up. I don't know if you featured this on your page yet, but um, there's Alex Gray is a visionary artist and uh, he has this community in Italy, this uh, ecological artist community called uh, Damenhur. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, but one of the inventions that somebody created on Damenhur is called Music of the Plants. And this machine, basically you plug uh, an electric cathode or anode or whatever it's called on a leaf or a root and the plants vibration will play a song so we all have these different vibes we all have these different songs we play uh like a squirrel song maybe <laughs> like high paced scattered an elephant song might be more low and and we all are reflections of this beautiful nature. We all have genetic material that is kindred to gorillas, kindred to elephants, kindred to fungi and uh, microscopic uh, bacteria and all of these things are literally a part of us. So creating our own song and collaborating with others and making your community kind of a, a symphony of what can we do for for the environment and um, a place I love in the United Kingdom is uh, Dardington Trust. 
and Darlington Trust is, is an art school and it has many different facets to it, but it has a real uh, ecological impact. And when you go there, it feels like a magical school. It feels like, to, to me at least, it feels like a Hogwarts or like a Jedi Academy. And it's com it was completely created by just a single seed. It was just this couple bought this property and loved art and loved nature. And from that alone, this magnificent space you go to, they're super wealthy as well, super financially well off, very uh, emotionally and spiritually well off. I mean, Ravi Shankar, who taught George Harrison uh, how to play sitar, uh, great musician from India, was there and just all of these magnificent people in and out of this place. And it all started with just a little intention. Just, I love art, I love nature, let's do something with it. And we could all do that, even if it's like pop an acorn out the window into an open field, and then there's an oak tree 100 years later, or maybe there isn't. But at least, <laughs> at least you like put it out there, like you said, it's inside you, at least get it out there somehow. It might not grow, like the, the acorn you plant might not turn into a magnificent oak tree, but the acorn you plant might live for 2000 years, like some of the oak trees my wife and I saw in uh, Northwest uh, France in Brittany. So just putting that intention in there is enough to make a difference in the world. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And then again, it, it's a, um, it ends up being, uh, like you said, the, the New York crosswalk situation, sometimes that intention inspires others. And that could be the purpose of the intention is actually, it could be an inspiration to someone that you don't even realize. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, I think it's fantastic how the, um, that idea of the, everyone has their, has their song and that the, um, the vibration of the plant music sounds really interesting. I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear that. Um, really curious to know what that actually sounds like. Uh, wh what was the name of the the? It's called uh, Music of the Plants. Music of the Plants. And so they, uh, I'm surprised that they don't have more uh, plants uh, now. But now people are buying the machine and uh, doing their own music with it. Uh, but they ho they hooked it up to like an old, old Indian Bodhi tree. Mm. And this Bodhi tree was just playing this song that was just, whoa. And you could feel, you get, this is this tree song. And then they hooked it up to a sunflower. And it was very like high pitched, angelic, like, la, la, like Lord of the Rings, like Elvish, <laughs> kind of like really up there but it was so in tune. And then <laughs> I, I saw this really funny video. This was not, uh, it was the same idea of music of the plants, but with a different machine. It was with a, with a uh, modular synth and it was like an old potato meets an onion for the first time. <laughs> and it's like playing this funky, funky, beat from just the electric impulses coming out of this potato and this uh onion and that was really funny i laughed my ass off with that it's, it's just, the video title i gotta find it again but it's like old ass potato meets uh onion for the first time and it's like wow this, for me it's really exciting because and i feel like a lot of people uh hearing these songs from the from the plants for the first time with music of the plants mainly is the uh, one where you could access this uh, information. But uh, people hearing for that for the first time are like, wow, this is like another level of life they're seeing. You know, there's more levels of, we know we can play music. We know we could sing and dance and do all this uh, fun, entertaining stuff, but what, potential can we have collaboratively if a sunflower can play that song like imagine 
John Lennon and Bob Marley and Stevie Wonder playing a symphony with, with a tree and a sunflower and they make this genius song. Stevie Wonder also has this really wonderful uh, album, I think it is. It might be a, just a solo song, but I think it's an album called The Secret Life of Plants. Everybody should definitely check that out. It's really very poetic about the liveliness of nature and how this sort of uh, consciousness exists in nature that we don't quite understand yet. Like music of the plants showed, showed me that a sunflower is singing its own song and we hear, I guess we can hear it somehow because we can feel what it's, what it's putting out. But to have a machine that can literally translate it, it's like if you met uh, an extraterrestrial and you can't talk with them and now you have a machine that can translate it into English or Chinese or Spanish or whatever. And you're like, oh, wow, I can talk with this person and exchange information. Now we can do that with, plants. And I personally do that through meditation. I don't uh, have one of those music of the plants machines, but I have loads of mint and uh, basil and flowers and uh, stuff in my garden and roses. And going into meditation, I can hear them. Like, it's not like they're not speaking English, but I can feel sort of the song they're singing, I guess, is that nature speaks and we can listen uh, with or without a machine, with or without science. Yeah, I, I mean, every every life has energy and in, in its own intelligence. And um, that's that's what's incredible about it. I mean, that's personally, I'm, for me, uh, I love forests. Uh, so, you know, some people say, oh, when I go to the ocean, that's where I feel calm. For me, it's a, it's a forest. Um, and if there's a lake involved, even better. Or, or a river somewhere. And yeah, I think it, it's just being surrounded by so many peaceful, uh, I suppose, present, uh, you know, life, um, so much life around that's um, without any sort of ego. And um, I, yeah, trees are incredibly being surrounded by trees. It's, it's very, very peaceful and it's beautiful. And you can, you can certainly feel the energy when you go into an old forest that's you know seen a lot, survived a lot, and has thrived, uh, you, you can absolutely feel it, and and the the quietness of it is amazing. And yet it's quiet, but as you said, there's there's an energy, um, and and for me it's very very refreshing and rejuvenating, mm. um, and I think that's there's what is that that um, the, the Japanese idea of forest bathing. Um, I, th I think that's ultimately what, what it comes down to is putting yourself in a place where you're surrounded by, by plants. And yeah, I mean, I, I have a number of plants here as well. And it's amazing because you can have a fake plant, you can be surrounded by fake plants and it, it's not remotely the same as having just a few living ones. So it's not the green, it's, uh, it's really the living being of a plant. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's wonderful. Yeah, and just for everyone listening, for everyone who has the uh, great uh, opportunity to listen to this great talk is that uh, find your space, right? As we were saying before, uh, there's all, we're just like the animals, we're just like the plants, we're just like the elements. We have places that make us feel a bit uh, better or give us certain medicine that we might need. And every environment presents a different opportunity for that individual or that group of people. Like going into the middle of the desert is fantastic for people who need lots of quiet, people who are quiet individuals or people who want to just kind of be in this very still, calm space. Then you have the river. The river is cleansing. It has a drive and a purpose to go through over obstacles, um, as well as reminding us that all water returns to the source, all water returns to the ocean. 
you go to the ocean, it is the source. <laughs> I think that's why a lot of people love the beach so much because it's like, oh, I'm back. I'm here. I'm here back at oneness. I get it. We're all drops of the ocean. Then you have the mountaintops is like you're closer to the stars. You're closer to the heavens. You're up, literally up high, up in a high elevation like uh, and spiritual communities like Tibet or India reflect this sort of quality. Uh, you go for a deep dive underwater, you kind of go into the depths, you feel a deeper experience of reality. Uh, and then you go into the tundra, go into the middle of the Arctic or Siberia or Alaska, and you get this sense of kind of the coldness of nature that, that uh, kind of re-familiarizing our consciousness with death as a, a cleansing process because the winter time kills insects, kills parasites, kills uh, certain bacteria, kills certain plants and animals. But then the springtime comes and there's this great rejuvenation. So those are some of the things that everyone can learn from nature. And it's not just that we can help nature, but uh, as an extension of uh, this natural body we're in, but nature helps us. I mean, I'm drinking nettle and green tea with some local honey, and this has healed my allergies. I had rough, rough seasonal allergies the other day. I was, oh my goodness, like ugh, sneezing like 70 times. And my wife goes to the local health food shop, gets me some green tea, nettle, parsley, uh, pomegranate juice, uh, local honey, all natural antihistamines. And uh, regular mainstream antihistamines never worked for me. They actually made it worse. But go to nature, go to the source. And like that, I was healed and remedied. And anyone can do this. And Stinging nettle is pretty cool as I just uh, was spending really lovely time with uh, one of my new friends, Oriana, uh, yesterday, and she's uh, part Ecuadorian. And so she has learned a lot from her. Her father's a shaman, and she's learned a lot about connecting with nature and plants. And she said, yeah, if you sting yourself with the nettle, it'll heal your allergies. And she took this leap. And not only did it heal my allergies, but she put it on my knee where I have a torn meniscus at the moment. And she said, this will help also pump blood to your uh, localized injury. And no physio, no doctor that I've talked to recently has any clue about any of this stuff. I mean, what they study, what they do is totally fine for them as much of an ego boost as it often is to wear that white coat and like, oh, I'm God now. But I'm like asking, okay, what can I do? They're like, oh, well, uh, you can't really do anything. I'm like, ah, that's not a good enough answer. <laughs> it's just like, like if nature can entirely rebuild its own ecosystem from dust, then I can heal a little broken branch in my knee. <laughs> I can heal a little cartilage in my knee. Well, so yes, I have a, a vengeance and a, <laughs> and a, and a affinity as someone connected to nature to, to sort of bring this natural medicine back to the forefront. Uh, and for the people I work specifically with in, in oracular work in divination and uh, meditative work is helping people connect back into that puzzle of nature and not dimming themselves down to fit into an environment that is toxic for them. Uh, but like being the holistic aspect of your mind, soul, body and finding a place that is the right environment for you. I was born and raised in New York, not my ideal place, not, not the land that I'm meant to be in. I moved and traveled around and go, oh, this is just, I was in the wrong environment. <laughs> it's just, just like a polar bear in, 
in Ecuador is not going to have a good time. <laughs> like, a, like um, an Arctic penguin is not going to have a good time in the hottest part of the desert in Africa. And the same thing, elephants not going to do well in, in the middle of the melting North Pole or the melting Arctic. So seems to be very cold for that elephant. But finding our piece, like we're a piece of this puzzle, finding where we fit in. And I, I don't know how, I can't really see my clock right now, but how are we doing on time? It is 11.04. Is what? 11.04. All right, so we're a little bit over time. So to finish up, uh, just hand it over to Daniel and just uh, would love to just hear whatever is on your mind right now for everyone listening. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, Owen, thank you very much for, for the time and, and for uh, yeah, sharing your thoughts, your stories, and for allowing me to, to share mine as well. And I think, you know, we're there's, it's easy to, to get caught up in the fact that we're not there yet. Um, we're, we're not at a place where, uh, you know, we're not at a place where everything is good or perfect. And the thing is, uh, we'll, we'll never actually get there. Uh, that's, there is not a, a real place. We're, we're always here. And so I, I suppose the, the one thing that I'm learning more and more is just be okay with where you are now because that's where everyone is. They're here right now. And when you can focus on that place, uh, that's where a lot of magic can happen. And from the point of view of sustainability, uh, letting go of um, a need to get somewhere else actually allows you to connect back to nature, connect back to yourself. And that's when, when you can really uh, do the work that you're meant to do and, and feel fulfilled. Um, there's a lot of peace that comes with just taking a step back and not actually constantly striving. There's a time and place for that. Um, and, but it's also, it's also good to just step back and rest and, and enjoy, uh, you know, what you have around you and, and what nature has to offer and, and all of that. And I think that's really where I'm, where love of the environment comes from and, and how we can all move towards a place where we're living more in harmony with nature and um, we can regenerate in the environment and have a, a happy, healthy, safe life on, on this planet. This was an absolutely wonderful talk. It's such an honor to have you here, Daniel. And just for everyone watching, take one step at a time, as Daniel reminded us, be here now, be present where you are, emotionally, mentally, physically, and just wishing you all so much love, so much joy, and connect to your environment, whether it's a small patch of soil with a, with a tree popping out, or whether it, all you have is city. Uh, even that is nature, like Daniel uh, geniusly reminded us. So on that note, big love to you all. Thank you all for watching. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And make sure you follow Sustainability Champions, not just because I'm telling you to, <laughs> but because it's like we need some good news. It's good news. It's really good news, and it'll give you some hope. Thank you all. Uh, big mahalos, big love. Peace.